The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill, and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic, and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining me. I'm Charles Christian and with me is Janie. And if you notice my voice is sounding a little bit croaky, this is not me trying to put on some um, sepulchral tones in the style of Vincent Price. I'm afraid I've just got a cold. I know. Coughs and colds, hexes and sneezes. Some apprentice witch has obviously left a cold spell in the air. Anyway, uh, we've got our usual varied selection of stories for you, but first over to Janie, who's been looking at some of the folklore and traditions associated with today, St Crispin's Day, the 25th of October. So, Janie, St Crispin's Day. Yes, well, I didn't know that was the 25th of October was St Crispin's Day. And why would you? No. However, following on from uh, ice cubes, which mm-hmm. you may be hearing about or have heard about. Yes. <laughs> chink, chink. <laughs> yeah. Um, St. Crispin Day cards. Make a big thing of it. You know, great commercial idea. Yeah. Halloween. Yeah. That sort of thing. Mm. Just just wondering. Ooh, However, it's not that exciting, to be fair. But, you know, I mean, I'm sure we could kind of... Pimp it up a bit. <laughs> Pimp up, you said, Crispin. <laughs> yeah. So who are they, you're probably wondering. Well, St Crispin and his brothers, that was St Crispian, um, they were Roman martyrs, apparently. Um, they died in about AD 285, so this is all, you know, quite ancient, mm-hmm. British kind of thing. Um, but their cult came to Britain um, and uh, via France, where apparently they're apparently they're buried in France. So by tradition, they were shoemakers and they lived for a little while in Faversham, in I've, Kent. I've got a little bit of information that. It says oh. apparently they uh, were at a house on the site of the Swan Inn in Preston Street. Right. Yeah. It all seems to be, you know, stacking up the evidence, doesn't mm-hmm. it, that that is actually true. Well, they were adopted as the patron saints of cobblers and leather workers. Mm-hmm. And even in some areas, these workers, they held processions and celebrations, um, much like other trades did on their patron patron saints' days. Um, And there there were some other uh, traces of other customers that lasted into the mid-19th century. There was um, something in Notes and Queries in 1852 that backs this up. It says, in the parishes of Cookfield and Hurst a Pierpoint in Sussex, it is still customary to observe St Crispin's Day and is kept with much rejoicing. The boys go round asking for money in the name of St Crispin, bonfires are lighted, and it passes off much in the same way as the 5th of November. Mm. You see? So there's a little bit of mm. credibility there for mm. it. Mm-hmm. I think we could be on a winner here. I anyway, think so. Yeah. Mm. Um, but the the real lasting resonance, if you like, for the day is patriotic rather than occupational, as it was on the day that the Battle of Agincourt was fought in 1415, mm-hmm. um, that was ever encapsulated in the lines from Act Four, Scene Three of Shakespeare's Henry V. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours. So there we are, we can have the big slap up meal. And say, tomorrow is St Crispian. 
and then he will strip his sleeve and show his scars. That's a bit of a downer, but... It is, it um, is. And say, these wounds I had on Crispin's Day. There you go. There you go. And indeed, that little uh, quote, it goes on to say, it's the famous lines, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. It's in the same section. Oh. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes. And, um, yes, people who weren't there, Henry V went on to say, shall hold their manhoods cheap <laughs> <laughs> while any speaks that fought upon fought with us upon St Crispin's Day. Yeah. So there we are. It, yeah, was, I think it was a thing. It was a thing. And, um, yeah, we'll work on that yes. for next year. A range of greeting cards is at this very moment. With showing, showing, showing medieval people with wounded arms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, we might leave that bit out. Yeah. Just have the drinking and the feasting. And the feasting, yes, and the bonfires. But yep. no fireworks. Mm. Good. Well, there we are. Something wicked this way comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror. A two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field. Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krause, Jim Jupp and Kemper Norton, to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome to have come of your own free will to the appointed place. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. With the days getting shorter and Halloween upon us, what better than a story about sinister Scottish castles, ghosts and legends and blood-soaked history. And no, I'm not talking about Glam's castle with its notorious secret chamber containing the walled-up remains of a hideous monster and, coincidentally, ancestor of the current Queen of England. Although I'll mention that a little bit later on. Instead, I'm focusing upon the Hermitage Castle in Liddersdale, which is part of the Borders region between England and Scotland. The original castle was built by the Anglo-Norman de Soules or de Soules family in the late 12th, early 13th century. Their holding of the hermitage came to an abrupt end in 1321 when William de Soules, who'd already switched sides once from fighting for the King of England against the Scots to backing King Robert the Bruce of Scotland against England, his change of heart uh, followed Bruce's victory at the Battle of Bannockburn, and... Uh, William de Soulist was accused of plotting a rebellion against King Robert. William may have had eyes on the throne himself, or else been planning to place the Bruce's rival, Edward Balliol, on the throne. However, we'll never know his true motivation, as the attempted coup was discovered at an early stage, William was arrested, charged with treason, and subsequently imprisoned in Dumbarton Castle, where he died in mysterious circumstances which means he was murdered. I'll be returning to the de Soulis family legend later in this story, but for the time being, it's fair to say William's treacherous antics pretty much set the standard for behaviour of all subsequent castellans of the Hermitage. After briefly being recaptured by the English in 1338, it was retaken by Sir William Douglas, known to Scottish history as the Knight of Liddersdale and the Flower of Chivalry. The latter title, it should be noted, refers only to Sir William's military prowess and definitely not to his noble and courteous character, as the following incident reveals. During one of the many wars of independence the Scottish fought against the English during the Middle Ages, uh, particularly in the early 14th century, Douglas developed a great jealousy of his erstwhile comrade, Sir Alfred Ramsay of Dalhousie, in 1342, Sir Alexander and his men recaptured Roxburgh Castle from the English. Now, the titular constable of this castle was Sir William Douglas, and he tried to take it several times but failed. 
For his efforts, Sir Alexander, the successful capturer of the castle, was appointed the Constable of Ruxborough and Sheriff of Teviotdale. These appointments outraged Sir William so much that he actually abducted Ramsay and threw him into an oubliette, that's a secret dungeon with access only through a trapdoor in its ceiling, at the Hermitage Castle, where he was left to starve. Legend has it that Ramsay survived for 17 days by eating small quantities of grain that fell through cracks in the floor of the castle granary which was above the dungeon. Subsequently, his emaciated corpse was found with the fingers gnawed to the bone. Fate, however, caught up with the Knight of Liddersdale in 1353 when he was killed by his own kinsman and godson, confusingly also called William Douglas, in a dispute over land. This member of the Douglas clan later became the first Earl of Douglas, who was responsible for rebuilding the Hermitage Castle in its current shape. The Douglas family, both the Earls of Douglas, also known as the Black Douglases, and the Earls of Angus, known as the Red Douglases, that's another story for another day, held on to the Hermitage until 1492 when King James IV of Scotland, suspicious that the then Earl of Angus, Archibald Beldercat Douglas, was a little too friendly to the point of treason with the English monarch King Henry VII and ordered him to give up the Hermitage Castle and hand it over to the Crown. Uh, why was... Archibald, or Archie Douglas, known as Beldercat. There's a medieval fable called the Mice in Council, where mice debate uh, how they're going to deal with a dangerous cat that keeps killing them. And someone suggests, what a great idea it would be if we put a bell around the cat's neck so that uh, we'd hear it ringing and it'd warn of his, of his approach. And we said, yeah, great idea. Uh, and then it suddenly hit the problem of, well, yeah, but who's going to put the bell around the cat's neck? And um, so it happened that in 1482, when a group of nobles who wanted to dispose of the then king's favourite, Robert Cochrane, a Lord Grey remarked, "'Tis well said, but who will dare bell the cat? The challenge was accepted by the Earl of Angus, that's Bell the Cat, Angus, and uh, he began by pulling the chain of office from Cochrane's neck and then ordered the hanging of Cochrane and a few other of his cronies from a bridge. And after that, surprisingly, um, Archie Douglas was always known as Bell the Cat. But back to our story. Having taken the Hermitage Castle, say it was a royal castle and therefore the king could decide who or not was held the lordship, having taken it from Archie Douglas, the king granted the lands and the lordship of Liddersdale to the Hepburn family, who later became the earls of Bothwell. Of the Hepburns, James Hepburn, the fourth Earl of Bothwell, is the most notorious as the lover and, briefly, husband of the Scottish monarch Mary, Queen of Scots. To understand the end of James' story, however, we first need to know a little bit more about the man. During a visit to Copenhagen in Denmark in 1559, he met a woman called Anna Trons, or some accounts put it as Tronson. She was a Norwegian noblewoman whose father was a famous Norwegian admiral, then serving at the Danish royal court. After a brief engagement, or likely possibly more a marriage under Norwegian law, James and Anna travelled around Europe. However, the relationship ended badly, with Anna complaining that James was only in an interested in her money, and James abandoned her. It was while he was on these European travels that James first met Mary, then the King of France's wife, in Paris. Later, back in Scotland, James Hepburn married a Lady Jean Gordon. And, uh, however, it didn't last very long, and they divorced the following year with his adultery with one of his wife's servants cited as the cause. Meanwhile, back in Paris, Mary's French husband... King of France had died, and so she returned to Scotland, and she returned as Queen because she was the only surviving legitimate child of King James V, and had technically been the Queen of Scotland since she was six days old. 
However, for the previous 20 years, during including the time when she was in France, the country had been run by regents. Mary married her first cousin, Henry Stuart, known to history as Lord Darnley, and they had a son, James, who later became King James VI. As it doesn't help that the Scottish call all their kings James. Uh, eight months later, however, in February 1567, Darnley's residence was destroyed in an explosion and Darnley was found dead in the garden. However, this was not a tragic accident. The explosion had been caused by two barrels of gunpowder going off under Darnley's sleeping quarters, while reports at the time suggest that Darnley showed signs of having been strangled when his body was found in the garden. It should be noted that by this time the relationship between Darnley and Mary was well and truly over. Uh, he kept pushing here to make him king, because at the time he was merely uh, the consort of the Queen, not a joint monarch. And all the contemporary reports suggest he was an annoyingly unpleasant person. And to cap it all, in March the previous year, this was when Mary was six months pregnant, Darnley and a group of nobles had, while Mary was actually still present there, stabbed to death her private secretary, David Rizzio. Uh, there again, Rizzio was believed by many people to be the real father of Mary's child. It was a bloody murder. Uh, Rizzio suffered a total of 56 stab wounds. Naturally, the relationship didn't really go much better after that. And Mary was suspected of being involved in the plot to kill her husband. However, she was conveniently staying elsewhere on the night of his murder. The prime suspect was James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, who by this time was certainly Mary's lover. Uh, however, being a strict Roman Catholic, Mary would not countenance divorcing Darnley. Hepburn was put on trial for Darnley's murder, but acquitted, and the following month, on the 15th of May, he married Mary. This, incidentally, was just a week after Hepburn's own divorce from his second wife. The circumstances leading up to the marriage remain surrounded in controversy. One suggestion is Hepburn kidnapped the Queen and raped her, and the alternative view is Mary was a willing participant in the kidnapping and the story was a fabrication, so her honour and reputation would not be ruined by her marriage to a man widely suspecting of murdering her husband. I hope you've got that. Yes, it's better to be raped and marry a murderer than to voluntarily marry a murderer. Hmm. Matrimonial bliss for our star-lost lovers only lasted a very short time, and within a month, disaster struck. As a study of Scottish medieval reveals, rather than uniting against a common enemy, the English, that's us lot, the Scottish nobility spent the best part of 500 years fighting among themselves over land, clan rivalries, dynastic claims, power at court. By the 16th century, they'd also add religion to the mix. Mary's marriage to Hepburn was a step too far, alienating not only the Protestant nobility, who resented Hepburn's power, but also Mary's Catholic followers, who were shocked by her behaviour. With the country seemingly on the verge of another civil war, Mary and Hepburn's forces met their opponents, known as the Confederate Lords, at a place called Carberry Hill, which is just east of Edinburgh. This was on the 15th of June. Rather than a battle, although a few shots were fired, it was more than a day-long standoff, ending with the Queen's forces gradually drifting away and abandoning the field. And uh, that was it. Their army was gone. Mary and Hepburn shared one final embrace, then she surrendered and he quickly fled the battlefield. For Mary, who was still only 24 at this point, it was the start of the slippery slope that would see her abdicate in favour of her son, that's James VI. Uh, she'd escape a Scottish prison, be driven into exile in England and subsequently be imprisoned and later beheaded at Fotheringay Castle in 1587 almost 20 years to the day after Darnley's murder, after being convicted of encouraging a Roman Catholic plot to assassinate Queen Elizabeth of England. Today, her ghost is said to still haunt the Hermitage Castle, seen in one of her more romantic trysts with Hepburn. As for Hepburn, his fate was no less cruel. 
After fleeing Carberry Hill, he eventually sailed across the North Sea, heading for Denmark, where he hoped to raise an army to restore Mary to power in Scotland. However, he actually made landfall off the coast of Norway, which was then ruled by Denmark, and was escorted into Bergen Harbour because he lacked proper papers. Unfortunately, Bergen was the hometown of Anna Thronsden. Remember her, the first wife? She promptly had him arrested and sued for abandonment and for the return of her dowry. There is a possibility that Hepburn could have wheeled his way out of trouble here, but then the Danish monarch, King Frederick, got to hear of the arrest. Frederick knew the English government was looking for Hepburn in connection with Darnley's murder, and he also recognised that if Mary ever did regain the Scottish crown, having Hepburn as a hostage would be a valuable bargaining chip. So he had Hepburn transferred from Bergen to a prison fortress near Copenhagen. Tragically, when news from both Scotland and England confirmed Mary would never again become Queen of Scots, Hepburn's value as a hostage plummeted and the king had him imprisoned in a place called Dragon's Home Castle where he was chained to a pillar in a dungeon and forgotten. Hepburn spent the last ten years of his life chained to that pillar. You can still see the circular groove his shackles carved out into the floor and he eventually died there, raving insane, in April 1578. In fact, you could still see what was claimed to be his mummified body in the crypt of a nearby church until a few decades ago. But we've not yet finished with our bloody history of the Hermitage Castle. After Hepburn, the next recorded keeper of the Hermitage Castle was his cousin, Francis Stuart, who also became the Earl of Bothwell. He was a grandson of King James V, albeit an illegitimate one, and was viewed as a potential alternative to James VI. He was certainly an inveterate dabbler in politics and intrigue, and in 1591 he was arrested, tried and imprisoned for his supposed involvement in the infamous North Berwick witchcraft trials. This was a moral panic largely instigated by King James VI, described by a contemporary as the wisest fool in Christendom, and uh, James was obsessed with witchcraft. In fact, he wrote a book about it, Demonology, which was published in 1597. James's belief was that there were a large number of witches and sorcerers in the Berwick area, which was a seaport town, who had used black magic to try to sink a fleet of royal ships travelling between Norway and Scotland. Uh, Francis Stuart was in fact pardoned, but a few months later he was accused of being involved in yet another plot against James, so he was stripped of his powers and the hermitage was granted to a guy called Sir Walter Scott, known as the Bold Buckley. Scott was a notorious border reaver, which is a polite name for a bandit and livestock rustler, and also an ancestor of the famous novelist Sir Walter Scott of some 300 years later. And this one, the Bull Buckley, almost started a war in 1596 between England and Scotland when he attacked Carlisle Castle and successfully liberated Willie Armstrong, another famous border reaver. War was only averted after Buckley rode south from the Hermitage and personally apologised to the Queen of Elizabeth. However, this was the last hurrah for the Hermitage, as in 1603 Elizabeth died and King James of Scotland ascended the throne of England. At a stroke, the Union of the Crowns, which is why King James is known as King James VI of Scotland and King James I of England, rendered castles like the Hermitage redundant, as there was no longer any need for a fortified border. And, within a very short period, the Liddesdale Fortress was abandoned and falling into disrepair. There does, however, remain one final mystery, namely, why did the Hermitage have such a dark history involving so much cruelty and treachery, even by the standards of those cruel and treacherous times? It was the Romans, in classical times, who developed the idea of the genius loci, or the spirit of a place, who would protect and bring good luck to the occupants of a home or villa. The corollary of this is some places seem to be permeated with such tragedy, horror and bad luck. You can only assume they are cursed, for want of a better term, by a Maleficus Spiritus Loci, or evil spirit of a place.
At the Hermitage, there is a ready-made candidate for this in the shape of the legend of Robin Redcap. Sometimes you'll see this character referred to as Redcap Sly. Robin Redcap is said to be a particularly malevolent and murderous goblin who served as the demonic familiar of one of the original owners of the Hermitage Castle. The 19th century writer Sir Walter Scott, that's the descendant of the Border Reaver who actually owned the castle at one stage, in his collections, The Minstrelsy of the Scottish Borders, records a ballad written by John Layden some hundred years earlier called Lord Sulis. However, Scott misidentifies evil Lord Sulis as the historical character William de Sulis, the one who was murdered at Dumbarton in 1321. Historians now suggest the individual in question was actually Sir Ranulph de Sulis, who was born around 1150 and murdered by his servants in the winter of 1207-1208. The official version of his death suggests he was killed by his servants and tenants because he was a cruel and oppressive landlord. The unofficial version says he was actually a sorcerer who had been sacrificing local children as part of his black magic rituals, and the locals executed him as a way to halt his evil ways. Let's delve a little deeper into this legend. Evil Lord Sulis had apparently sold his soul to the devil and in exchange he was given Robin Redcap as his familiar and assistant. Redcap is described as a short, thick-set old man with long, prominent teeth, skinny fingers armed with talons like eagles, large eyes of a fiery red colour and grisly hair streaming down his shoulders. He also wears iron boots for stomping on the bones of his victims, carries a pike staff in his left hand for spearing his victims, and sports a red cap on his head which he soaks in his victim's blood, giving it a crimson hue. Apparently the only protection against red cap is to repeat the words of the scripture or to hold up a cross, and then he will utter a dismal yell and vanish in flames, leaving behind a large tooth on the spot where he was last seen. <laughs> Robin Redcap apparently lived in an iron chest secured by three strong padlocks and could only be summoned by Lord Ranulph, knocking on it three times. As part of the demonic pact, Lord Sulis was also protected by an unholy charm against any injury from rope or steel. This meant he could not be killed by swords, daggers or axes, and he could not be shackled by chains or rope, and he could not be hanged. However, he was not immortal, and on the advice of the famous Borders Laird and mystic Thomas the Rhymer, like Sir Ranulph, an actual historical character, Lord Sulis was rolled up in a sheet of lead, rather like you'd wrap somebody up in a roll of carpet, then carried up to the nearby nine-stain rig Neolithic stone circle, dropped in a large cauldron over a blazing fire, and boiled to death. The Victorian-era writer, spiritualist and journalist W.T. Stead sums up Lord Sulis's fate neatly in this poem. On a circle of stone they placed the pot, on a circle of stones but barely nine, they heated it up red and fiery hot, till the burnished brass did glimmer and shine. They rolled him up in a sheet of lead, a sheet of lead for a funeral pall. They plunged him into the cauldron red, and melted him, lead, bones and all. Hmm, that was the end of Lord Sulis. However, Ranulph Sulis's ghost is said to return to haunt the Hermitage Castle every seven years, the spectre making its way around the castle's vaults and dungeons, which still echo with the screams of his victims. As for Robin Redcap, he too is said to still haunt the castle and to meet up with the shade of his master, Lord Sulis, every seventh year. So be warned, the next seven years cycle occurs in two years' time in 2020. Now, a little bit of background information. If you want to visit the Hermitage Castle today, uh, it has been partly restored and is managed by the Scottish Government Agency Historic Environment Scotland and is open to the public from April till the end of October. Uh, its location is Newcastleton in Roxburgh, Scotland. 
and the present ruins date back to the 14th century, taking the form, a very distinct form, of a tower house keep with an enormous gatehouse. This replaced the earlier Moton Bailey Castle. And I also said I'd tell you a little bit about Glarms and its legends. Um, I couldn't just leave you with the fact that there was a monster in a sealed room that was a relation of the Queen of England. Well, the bloody history of Glarms Castle begins in the 11th century when King Malcolm II was murdered there. Shakespeare makes the castle the home of the murderous Macbeth. And in the 14th century, Glarms became the home of the Lion family, now Bowes Lion, and remains their property. Uh, first as the Thanes of Glarms, later Lords, and now the Earls of Strathmore and Kingshorn. And um, the late Queen Mother, that's the mother of the current English monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, was born there in 1900. As for the ghosts of Glarms Castle, well, we are heading towards Halloween. There is a tongueless woman said to be a serving girl who had her tongue cut out to prevent her talking about her illicit affair with one of the lords of Glarms. Her ghost is sometimes seen looking out from a barred window. Then there is the Grey Lady, believed to be the ghost of Janet Douglas, the Lady of Glarms, who was unjustly convicted of witchcraft and burned at the stake in Edinburgh in 1537. There is the ghost of Jack the Runner, a black slave boy supposedly killed by one of the earls who hunted him down with a pack of hounds in a perverse variation of fox hunting. And there is Earl Beardy, said to be Alexander Lindsay, the Earl of Crawford, who died sometime round about 1453. He was a visitor of the castle and uh, one Sunday night in a drunken rage said if he couldn't find someone to play cards with, nobody wanted to play cards with it, take him up on his offer because it was the Sabbath day, he said if he couldn't find anybody to play cards with him, he'd play with the devil himself until doomsday. Be careful for what you wish for. A few minutes later, according to the story, there was a knock at the castle door, and there stood a tall stranger in a long dark coat, who asked if Earl Beardy still needed someone to play cards with. He was shown to the Earl's room, and they played all night, but come the morning, the stranger had disappeared. Take him with him, the Earl's soul. Now, says the legend, Earl Beardy's ghost is trapped in a secret room in the castle, doomed to keep playing cards with the devil for all eternity. And talking of secret rooms, undoubtedly the most famous legend associated with Glarms tells of a secret room or suite of rooms that was the home, in effect a prison, of a hideously deformed child of the Bowes Lion family, a child who was the rightful heir to the earldom. This was reputedly Thomas, the grandson of the 11th Earl of Strath Strathmore, who was born in 1821. Known as the Monster of Glarms, no subtlety there, he is described in one account as half man, half toad, and in another as having a chest like an enormous barrel, hairy as a doormat, with a head that ran straight into his shoulders, but with toy-like arms and legs. When he died, the rooms were bricked up so the awful secret could be kept from the world a secret that was subsequently only passed on from the Earl to his eldest son. Curiously, there is another, far more shameful, but probably more historical, accurate legend associated with the secret rooms bricked up within the walls of Glarms Castle. This dates back to 1486, when members of the Ogilvy clan, who were on the run from their enemies, the Crawfords, that's... Remember that? Uh, Earl Beardy was one of the Crawfords. Uh, the Ogilvy clan turned up at the castle seeking sanctuary from the then Lord of Glarms. He granted them sanctuary and had them taken to a room deep within the castle. And then had the door locked and barricaded from the outside. Four weeks elapsed before anyone bothered to look inside the room again, but by then only one Ogilvy was still alive, having survived by eating the emaciated corpses of his fellow clansmen. Not that it did any good, as Lord Glams promptly had him killed and the room permanently bricked up, presumably to conceal his betrayal of a promise of sanctuary. This walled-up chamber is sometimes referred to as the Room of Skulls. So, if there's a moral of that story... Be careful of which Scottish castles you stay in. You are listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian 
on internet radio and podcast. That's it. We're almost out of time. But before we go, here's a strange fact about money for you. Uh, The location is the South Sea, well, Western Pacific Island state of Palau, P-A-L-A-U. I'm not quite sure how it's correctly pronounced. And it produced a limited edition silver dollar coin in 2007 that contained holy water. You heard it, holy water. So I'm guessing if you get your hands on one of those, it just might be useful as a bit of protection in case you encounter a vampire. Perhaps uh, throw it in their direction. Anyway, Janie and I look forward to joining you again next time. But until then, the nights are growing darker. They're darker now than sin. May your gods and goddesses protect you from ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night. Good night. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic and folklore. Keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com or by email at urbanfantasist.icloud.com or on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Good night. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show.